Section seven of Orientations. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lilith Brenda. Orientations by W. Smith at Mom. Section seven. The choice of Amintas. Part two. When Amintas, on his departure, shyly offered some remuneration for his entertainment, it was with an exquisite southern grace that she relieved him of his ten golden guineas, and he almost felt she was doing him a favour as she carelessly rattled the coins into a silken purse, and if he was a little dismayed to see his treasure go so speedily, he was far too delicate-minded to betray any emotion that he resolved to lose no time in finding out the offices of the wealthy Tiffel. But Van Tiffel was no longer in Cardiff. On the outbreak of the treaty, the Spanish authorities had given the Dutch merchant four and twenty hours to leave the country, and had seized his property, making him understand that it was only by a signal mercy that his life was spared. Amintas rushed down to the harbour in dismay. The good ship Calderon had already sailed, Amintas cursed his luck. He cursed himself. Above all, he cursed the lovely Spanish lady whose charms had caused him to delay his search for Van Tiffel till the ship had gone on his eastward journey. After looking long and wistfully at the sea, he turned back into the town and rambled melancholy through the streets, wondering what would become of him. Soon the pangs of hunger assailed him and he knew the discomfort of a healthy English appetite. He hadn't a single farthing, and even Scotch poets, when they come to London to set the Thames on fire, are wont to put a half-crown piece in their pockets. Amintas meditated upon the folly of extravagance, the indiscretion of youth, and the wickedness of woman. He tightened his belt and walked on. At last, feeling weary and faint with hunger, he lay down on the steps of a church and there spent the night. When he awoke next morning, he soon remembered that he had slept supperless. He was breathless. Suddenly his eye, looking across the square, caught sight of a bookshop, and it occurred to him that he might turn to account the books which his father and the parson had given him. He blessed his foresight. The Bible fetched nothing, but the Aristotle brought him enough to keep him from starvation for a week. Having satisfied his hunger, he set about trying to find work. He went to booksellers and told them his accomplishments, but no one could see any use in the knowledge of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew Bible. He applied at shops, growing bolder with necessity. He went into merchants' office and to great men's porters, but all with great civility sent him about his business, and poor Amintas was no more able to get work than nowadays the professional tram or the secretary of a trades union. Four days he went on, trying here and trying there, eating figs and melons and bread, drinking water, sleeping beneath archways or on the steps of churches and he dreamed of the home of roast beef and ale which he had left behind him. Every day he became more disheartened, but at last he rose up against fate. He cursed it ironically. Every man's hand was against him. His hand should be against every man. He would be a brigand. He shook off his feet the dust of Cardiff, and boldly went into the country to find the band of free companions, he stopped herdsmen and peddlers and asked them where brigands were. They pointed to the mountains, and to the mountains he turned his face. He would join the band, provoke a quarry with the chief, kill him, and be made chief in his stead. Then he would scour the country in a velvet mask and a peaked hat, with a feather in it, carrying fire and desolation everywhere. A prize would be set on his head, but he would snap his fingers in the face of the prime minister. He would rule his followers with an iron hand, but now he was in the midst of the mountains, and there were not the smallest size of lawless folk, not even the gibbets with the skeleton hanging in chains to show where lawless folk had been. He sought high and low, but he never saw a living soul besides a few shepherds clothed in skins. It was most disheartening. Once he saw two men crouching behind a rock and approached them but as soon as they saw him they ran away, and although he followed them, shouting that they were not to be afraid, since they wanted to be a brigand too, 
They paid no attention. We only ran the faster, and at last we had to give up the chase for want of breath. One can't be a robber chief all by oneself, nor is it given to everyone in this world to be a brigand. Amintas found that even heroes have their limitations. One day, making his way along a rocky path, he found a swineherd guarding his flock. Good morrow, said the man, and asked Amintas whither he was found. God knows, answered Amintas. I am wandering at chance, and know not where I go. Well, youth, stay the night with me, and tomorrow you can set out again, and return for your company I will give you food and shelter. Amintas accepted gratefully, for he had been feeding on herbs for a week, and the prospect of goat's milk, cheese, and black bread was like the feast of Trimalchion. When Amintas had said his story, the herdsman told him that there was a rich man in the neighbouring village. He wanted a swine herd, and in the morning showed him the way to the rich man's house. I will come a little way with you, lest you take the wrong path. They walked along the rocky track, and presently the way divided. This path to the right leads to the village, said the man, and this one to the left, swine herd? The swine herd crossed himself. Ah! That is the path of evil fortune. It leads to the cursed coffin. A cold wind blew across their faces. Come away, said the herdsman, shuddering. Do you not feel on your face the cold breath of it? Tell me what it is, said Amintas. He stood looking at the opening between the low trees. It's a lake of death, a lake beneath the mountain, and the roof of it is held up by marble columns, which were never wrought by the hand of man. Come away, do you not feel on your face the cold breath of it? He dragged Amintas away along the path that led to the village, and when the way was clear before him, turned back, returning to his swine. But Amintas ran after him. Tell me what they say of that cursed coffin. They say many things. Some say it is a treasure house of the Moors, where they have left their wealth, some say it is an entrance to the enchanted land. Some say it is an entrance to hell itself. Venturous men have gone in to discover the terrible secret, but none has returned as hell it. Amintas wandered slowly towards the village, where his dreams to end in the herding of swine. What was this cavern of which the herdsman spoke? He felt a strange impulse to go back and look at the dark opening between the little trees from which blew the cold wind. But perhaps the rich man had a beauteous daughter. History is full of the social successes of swine herds. Amintas felt a strange thrill as the dark lick came before his mind. He almost heard the lapping of the water. King's daughters had often looked upon lowly swine herds and raised them to golden thrones. But he could not help going to look again at the dark opening between the little trees. He walked back and again the cold breath blew against his face. He felt in it the icy coldness of the water. It drew him in. He separated the little trees on either side. He walked on as if a hidden power urged him. And now the path became less clear. Trees and bushes grew in the way and hindered him. Brambles and long creeping plants twisted about his legs and pulled him back. But the wind with its coldness of the black water drew him on. The birds of the air were hushed, and not one of the thousand insects of the wood uttered a note. Great trees above him hid the light. The silence was ghastly. He felt as if he were the only person in the world. Suddenly he gave a cry. He had come to the end of the forest, and before him he saw the opening of the cavern. He looked in. He saw black, stagnant water motionless and heavy, and as far as the eye could reach, sombre pillars covered with green, moist slime, they stood half out of the water, supporting the roof, and from the roof oozed moisture which fell in heavy drops, in heavy drops continually. At the entrance was a little skiff with a paddle in it. Aminta stood at the edge. Dared he venture? What could there be behind that darkness? The darkness was blacker than the blackest night. He stepped into the boat. Should he go? With beating heart he untied the rope. He hardly dared to breathe. He pushed away. 
He looked to the right and left, paddling slowly. On all sides, he saw the slimy column stretching regularly into the darkness. The light of the open day grew dimmer as he advanced. The air became colder. He looked eagerly around him, paddling slowly. Already he half repented the attempt. The boat went along easily, and the black and heavy water hardly splashed as he drew his paddle through it. Still, nothing could be seen but the even ranks of pillars. Then, all at once, the night grew blacker, and again the cold wind arose and blew in his face. Everywhere was the ghastly silence and the darkness. A shiver went through him. He could not bear it. In an agony of terror, he turned his pedal to go back. Whatever might be the secret of the cavern or the reward of the adventure, he dared go no further. He must get back quickly to the open air and the blue sky. He drew his paddle through the water. The boat did not turn. He gave a cry. He pulled with all his might. The boat only lurched a little and went on its way. He set his teeth and backed. His life depended upon it. The boat swam on. A cold sweat broke out over him. He put all his strength in his stroke. The boat went on, into the darkness swiftly and silently. He paused a little to regain force. He stifled a sob of horror and despair. Then he made a last effort. The skiff whirled round into another avenue of columns, and the paddle shivered into atoms against a pillar. The little light of the cavern entrance was lost, and there was utter darkness. Amintas cowered down in the boat. He gave up hope of life and lay there for long hours, awaiting his end. The water carried the skiff along swiftly, silently. The darkness was so heavy that the columns were invisible. Heavy drops fell into the water from the roof. How long would it last? Would the boat go on till he died and then speed on forever? He thought of the others who had gone into the coffin. Were there other boats hurrying eternally along the heavy waters, bearing cold skeletons? He covered his face with his hands and moaned. But he started up. The night seemed less black. He looked intently. Yes, he could distinguish the outlines of the pillars dimly, so dimly that he thought he saw them only in imagination. And soon he could see distinctly their massive shapes against the surrounding darkness, and as gradually the night thinned away in the dim twilight, he saw that the columns were different from those at the entrance of the cavern. They were no longer covered with weed and slime. The marble was polished and smooth, and the water beneath him appeared less black. The skiff went on so swiftly that the perpetual sequence of the pillars tired his eyes, but their grim severity gave way to round columns less forbidding and more graceful. As the light grew clearer, there was almost a tinge of blue in the water. Amintas was filled with wonder, for the columns became lighter and more decorated surmounted by capitals adorned with strange sculptures some were green some were red others were yellow or glistening white they mirrored themselves in the sapphire water gradually the roof raised itself and the columns became more slender from them sprang lofty arches gorgeously ornamented in all was gold and silver and rich colour the water turned to dazzling translucent blue so that Amintas could see hundreds of feet down to the bottom, and the bottom was covered with golden sand, and the light grew and grew till it was more brilliant than the clearest day. Gradually the skiff slowed down and it swam leisurely towards the light source, threading its way beneath the horseshoe arches among the columns, and these gathered themselves into two lines to form a huge avenue surmounted by a vast span, and at the end, in a splendour of light, Amintas saw a wondrous palace, with steps leading down to the water. The boat glided towards it, and the steps ceased moving. At the same moment, the silver doors of the palace were opened, and from them issued black slaves, magnificently apparelled. They descended to Amintas, and with courteous gestures assisted him out of the boat. Then two other slaves, even more splendidly attired than their fellows, came down and led Amintas slowly 
and with great state into the court of the palace at the end of which was a great chamber into these they motioned the youth to enter they made him the lowest possible bows and retired letting a curtain fall over the doorway but immediately the curtain was raised and other slaves came in bearing gorgeous robes and all kinds of necessaries for the toilet with much ceremony they proceeded to bathe and scent the fortunate creature they polished and dyed his fingernails they pencilled his eyebrows and faintly darkened his long eyelashes they put precious balsam on his hair then they clothed him in silken robes glittering with gold and silver they put the daintiest red morocco shoes on his feet a jewelled chain about his neck rings on his fingers and in his turban a rich diamond finally they placed before him a gigantic mirror and left him everything had been conducted in complete silence and amintas throughout had preserved the most intense gravity but when he was alone he gave a little silence laugh of delight it was obvious that at last he was to be rewarded according to his deserts he looked at the rings on his fingers resisting a desire to put one or two of them in his pocket in case of a future rainy day then catching sight of himself in the mirror he started was that really himself how very delightful he made sure that no one could see and then began to make bows to himself in the mirror he walked up and down the room observing the stateliness of his gesture he waved his hands in a lordly patronizing fashion he turned himself round to look at his back he was very annoyed that he could not see his profile he came to the conclusion that he looks every inch a king's son and his inner consciousness told him that consequently the king's daughter could not be far off but he would explore his palace he girded his sword about him it was a scimitar of beautiful workmanship and the scabbard was encrusted with precious stones from the court he passed into many wonderful rooms one leading out of the other there were rich carpets on the marble floors and fountains played softly in the centre the walls were inlaid with rare marbles but he never saw a living soul in the last hour aminta had become fully alive to his great importance and carried himself accordingly he took long dignified steps and held one hand on the jeweled hilt of his sword with his elbow stuck out at right angles to his body his hat was thrown back proudly and his nostrils dilated with appropriate scorn at last he came to a door closed by a curtain he raised it but he started back and was so surprised that he found no words to express his emotions four maidens were sitting in the room more beautiful than he had thought possible in his most extravagant dreams the gods had evidently not intended amintas for single blessedness the young person appeared not to have noticed him two of them were seated on rugs playing a languid game of chess the others were lazily smoking cigarettes mate murmured one of the players oh sighed the other yawning another game finished that makes five million and twenty-three games against your five million and seventy-nine they all yawned but amintas felt he must give notice of his presence and suddenly remembering an expression he had learned on board ship he put on a most ferocious look and cried out shiver my timbers the maidens turned towards him with a little cry but they quickly recovered themselves and one of them came towards him you speak like a king's son o oh youth she said there was a moment's hesitation and the lady with a smile added oh ardently expected one you are a compendium of the seven excellences then they all began to pay him compliments each one capping the other's remarks you have a face like the full moon o oh youth your eyes are the eyes of the gazelle your walk is like the gait of the mountain partridge your chin is as an apple your cheeks are pomegranates but amintas interrupted them for god's sake madam he said let us have no palavering and if you love me give me some victuals immediately female slaves came in with salvers laden with choice food and the four maidens plied amintas with delicacies at the end of the repast they sprinkled him with rose water and the eldest of them put a crown of roses on his hair 
Aminta thought that after all life was not an empty dream. And now, may it please you, a stranger, to hear our story. Know then that our father was a Moor, one of the wealthiest of his people, and he dwelt with his fellows in Spain, honoured and beloved. Now, when Allah, whose name be exalted, decreed that our nation should be driven from the country, he, unwilling to leave the land of his birth, built him, with the aid of magic arts, this palace. Here he brought us, his four daughters and all his riches. He peopled it with slaves and filled it with all necessary things, and here we lived in peace and prosperity for many years. But at last a great misfortune befell us, for our father, who was a very learned man and accustomed to busy himself with many abstruse matters, when they got lost in a metaphysical speculation, and has never been found again. Here she stopped, and they all sighed deeply. We searched high and low, but in vain, and he has not been found to this day. So we took his will, and having broken the seal, read the following. My daughters, I know by my wisdom that the time will come when I shall be lost to you. Then you will live alone, enjoying the riches and the pleasures which I have put at your disposal. But I foresee that at the end of many years a youth will find his way to this your palace, and though my magic arts have been able to build this paradise for your habitation, though they have endowed you with perpetual youth and loveliness, and greatest deed of all, have banished hence the dark shadow of death yet have they not the power to make four maidens live in happiness and unity with but one man therefore i have given unto each of you certain gifts and of you four the youth shall choose one to be his love and to him and her shall belong this palace and all my riches and all my power while the remaining three shall leave everything here to these two and depart hence forever. Now, gentle youth, it is with you to choose which of us four you will have remain. Amintas looked at the four damsels standing before him, and his heart beat violently. I, resumed the speaker, I am the eldest of the four, and it is my right to speak first. She stepped forward and stood alone in front of Amintas, her aspect was most queenly, her features beautiful and clear, her eyes proud and fiery, and masses of raven hair contrasted with the red flaming of her garments. With an imperious gesture, she flung back her hair and spoke thus. No use that the gift which my father gave me was the gift of war, and I have the power to make great warrior of him, whose love I am. I will make you a king, youth, you shall command mighty armies, and you shall lead them to battle on a prancing horse. Your enemies shall quail before your face, and at last you shall die no sluggard's death, but pierced by honourable wounds, and fields of battle shall be your deathbed. A nation shall mourn your loss, and your name shall go down famous to after ages. You are very beautiful, said Amintas, but I am not so eager for warlike exploits as when I wander through the green lanes of my native land. Let me hear the others. A second stepped forward. She was clad most gorgeously of all. A crown of diamonds was on her head, and her robes were of clothes of gold sewn with rubies and emeralds and sapphires. The gift I have to give is wealth, riches, riches innumerable, riches greater than man can dream of. Do you want to be a king? The riches I can give will make you one. Do you want armies? Riches can procure them. Do you want victory? Riches can buy it. All these that my sister offers you can I with my riches give you, and more than that, for everything in the world can be got with riches, and you shall be all-powerful. Take me to be your love, and I will make you the lord of gold. Naminta smiled. You forget, lady that i am but twenty the third stepped forward she was beautiful and pale and thoughtful her hair was yellow like corn when the sun is shining on it and her dress was green like the young grass of the spring she spoke without the animation of the others mournfully rather than proudly and she looked at amintas with melancholy eyes 
I am the lady of art. All that is beautiful and good and wise is in my province. Live with me. I will make you a poet, and you shall sing beautiful songs. You shall be wise, and in perfect wisdom, O oh youth, is perfect happiness. The poet has said that wisdom is weariness, O oh lady, said Amintas. My father is a poet. He has written ten thousand Latin hexameters and a large number of Greek iambics. Then came forward the last. As she stood before Amintas, a cry burst from him. He had never in his life seen anyone so ravishingly beautiful. She was looking down, and her long eyelashes prevented her eyes from being seen. But her lips were like a perfect rose, and her skin was like a peach. Her hair fell to her waist in great masses of curls, and her sparkling auburn, many-hued and indescribable, changed in the sunbeams from richest brown to gold, tinged with deep red. She wore a simple tunic of thin silk, clasped at her waist with a jeweled belt of gold. She stood before Amintas, letting him gaze. Then suddenly she lifted her eyes to his. Amintas' heart gave a mighty beat against his chest. Her eyes, her eyes were the very lights of love, carrying passionate kisses on their beams. A sob of ecstasy choked the youth and he felt that he could kneel down and worship before them. Slowly, her lips broke into a smile, and her voice was soft and low. I am the lady of love, she said. Look. She raised her arms, and the thin, loose leaves falling back displayed their roundness in exquisite shape. She lifted her head, and Aminta thrilled to cover her neck with kisses. At last, she loosened her girdle, and when the silken tunic fell to her feet, she stood before him in perfect loveliness. I cannot give you fame, or riches, or wisdom. I can only give you love, love, love. Oh, what an eternity of delight shall we enjoy in one another's arms. Come, my beloved, come. Yes, I come, my darling. Aminta stepped forward with outstretched arms and took her hands in his. I take you for my love. I want not wealth, nor great renown, but only you. You will give me love alluring kisses, and we will live in never-ending bliss. He drew her to him, and, with his arms round her, pressed back her hat and cuffed her lips with kisses. And while Amindus lost his soul in the eyes of his beloved, the three sisters went sadly away. They ascended the stately barge which awaited them, and the water bore them down the long avenue columns into the darkness. After a long time, they reached the entrance of the cavern, and having placed a great stone against it, that none might enter more, they separated, wandering in different directions. The Lady of War passed through Spain, finding none there worthy of her. She crossed the mountains, and presently she fell in love with a little artillery officer, raised him to dignity and power, and together they ran through the lands, wasting and burning, making women widows and children orphans, ruthless, unsparing, caring for naught but the voluptuousness of blood. But she sickened of the man at last and left him. Then the blood he had spilt rose up against him, and he was cast down and died in exile on a lonely isle. And now they say she dwells in the palaces of her youth with a withered hand. Together they rule a mighty empire, and their people cry out at the oppression. But the ruler heeds nothing but the burning kisses of his love. The lady of riches, too, passed out of Spain. But she was not content with one love, nor with a hundred. She gave her favours to the first comer, and every one was welcome. She wandered carelessly through the world, but chiefly she loved an island in the north, and in its capital she has her palace, and the inhabitants of the isle have given themselves over, body and soul, to her domination. They pander and lie and cheat, and forswear themselves. To gain her smile they will shrink from no base deed, no meanness, and she, too, makes women widows and children orphans. But her subjects care not, 
they are fat and well content the goddess smiles on them and they are the richest in the world the lady of art has not found an emperor nor a mighty people to be her lovers she wanders lonely through the world now and then a youthful dreamer sees her in his sleep and devotes his life to her pursuit but the way is hard very hard so he turns aside to worship at the throne of her sister of riches and she repays him for the neglect he has suffered she showers gold upon him and makes him one of her knights but sometimes the youth remains faithful and goes through his life in the endless search and at last when his end has come she comes down to the garret in which he lies cold and dead and stooping down kisses him gently and lo he is immortal but as for amyntas when the sisters had retired he again took his bride in his arms and covered her lips with kisses and she putting her arms round his neck said with a smile i have waited for you so long my love so long and here it is fit that we should follow the example of the three sisters and retire also the moral of this story is that if your godfathers and godmothers at your baptism give you a pretty name you will probably marry the most beautiful woman in the world and live happily ever afterwards and the platitudinous philosopher may marvel at the tremendous effects of the most insignificant causes for if Amintas had been called peter or john as his mother wished william the second might be eating sauerkraut as peacefully as his ancestors the lord mayor of london might not drive about in a gilded carriage and possibly even Mr. Alfred Austin might not be poet laureate. End of section 7。Section 8 of Orientations。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Org. Recording by Lily Brander. Orientations by W. Somerset Mom. Section 8. Daisy. Part 1. It was Sunday morning, a damp, warm November morning, with the sky overhead grey and low. Miss Reed stopped a little to take breath before climbing the hill, at the top of which, in the middle of the churchyard, was Blackstable Church. Miss Reed panted and the sultriness made her loosen her jacket she stood at the junction of the two roads which led to the church one from the harbour end of the town and the other from the station behind her lay the houses of blackstable the wind-beaten houses with the slate roofs of the old fishing village and the red brick villas of the seaside resort which blackstable was fast becoming in the harbour were the masts of the ships colliers that brought coal from the north and beyond the grey sea very motionless mingling in the distance with the sky the peal of the church bell ceased and was replaced by a single bell ringing a little hurriedly querulously which denoted that there were only ten minutes before the beginning of the service miss reed walked on she looked curiously at the people who passed her wondering "'Good morning, Mr. Golding,' she said to a fisherman who panted by her, ungainly in his Sunday clothes. "'Good morning, Miss Reed,' he replied. "'Warm this morning.' She wondered whether he knew anything of the subject which made her heart beat with excitement whenever she thought of it, and for thinking of it she hadn't slept a wink all night. "'Have you seen Mr. Griffiths this morning?' she asked, watching his face. "'No. I saw Mrs. Griffiths and George as I was walking up oh they are coming to church then miss reed cried with the utmost surprise mr golding looked at her stupidly not understanding her agitation but they had reached the church miss reed stopped in the porch to wipe her boots and pass an arranging hand over her hair then gathering herself together she walked down the aisle to her pew she arranged the hassock and knelt down clasping her hands and closing her eyes she said the lord's prayer and being a religious woman she did not immediately rise 
but remained a certain time in the same position of worship to cultivate a proper frame of mind her long sallow face upraised her mouth firmly closed and her eyelids quivering a little from the devotional force with which she kept her eyes shut her thin bust very erect was encased in a black jacket as in a coat of steel but when miss reed considered that a due period had elapsed she opened her eyes and as she rose from her knees bent over to a lady sitting just in front of her have you heard about the griffiths mrs howlett no what is it answered mrs howlett half turning round intensely curious miss reed waited a moment to heighten the effect of her statement daisy griffith has eloped with an officer from the depot at tankerbury mrs howlett gave a little gasp you don't say so it's all they could expect whispered miss reed they ought to have known something was the matter when she went into tankerbury three or four times a week blackstable is six miles from tankerbury which is a cathedral city and has a cavalry depot i've seen her hanging about the barracks with my own eyes said mrs howlett but i never suspected anything shocking isn't it said miss reed with suppressed delight but how do you find out asked mrs howlett Shh, whispers to miss reed the widow in her excitement had raised her voice a little and miss reed could never suffer the least irreverence in church she never came back last night and george browning saw them get into the london train at tankbury well i never exclaimed mrs howlett do you think the griffiths will have the face to come to church i shouldn't if i was them said miss reed but at that moment the vestry door was opened and the organ began to play the hymn i'll see you afterwards miss reed whispered hurriedly and rising from their seats those ladies began to sing o oh, jesus thou art standing outside the fast closed door in lowly patience waiting to pass the threshold over we bear the name of christians miss reed held the book rather close to her face being short-sighted but without even lifting her eyes she had become aware of the entrance of mrs griffith and george she glanced significantly at mrs howlett mr griffith hadn't come although he was churchwarden and mrs howlett gave an answering look which meant that it was then evidently quite true but they both gathered themselves together for the last verse taking breath o oh, jesus thou art pleading in accents meek and low amen the congregation fell to his knees and the curate rolling his eyes to see who was in church began gabbling the morning prayers dearly beloved brave friend at the sunday dinner the vacant place of daisy griffiths stared at them her father sat at the head of the table looking down at his plate in silence every now and then without raising his head he glanced up at the empty space filled with the madness of grief he had gone into tankerbury in the morning inquiring at the houses of all daisy's friends imagining that she had spent the night with one of them he could not believe that george browning's story was true he could so easily have been mistaken in the semi-darkness of the station and even he had gone to the barracks his cheeks still burned with the humiliation asking if they knew a daisy griffith he pushed his plate away with a groan he wished passionately that it was monday so that he could work and the post would surely bring a letter explaining the vicar asked where you were said mrs griffith robert the father looked at her with his pained eyes but her eyes were hard and shining her lips almost disappeared in the tight closing of the mouth she was willing to believe the worst he looked at his son he was frowning he looked as coldly angry as the mother he too was willing to believe everything and they neither seemed very sorry perhaps they were even glad i was the only one who loved her he muttered to himself and pushing back his chair he got up and left the room he almost tottered he had aged twenty years in the night aren't you going to have any pudding asked his wife he made no answer he walked out into the courtyard quite aimlessly 
but the force of habit took him to the workshop where every sunday afternoon he was used to going after dinner to see that everything was in order and to-day also he opened the window put away a tool which the men had left about examined to such a day's work mrs griffith and george stiff and ill at ease in his clumsy sunday clothes went on with their dinner do you think the vicar knew he asked as soon as the father had closed the door i don't think he'd have asked if he had mrs gray might but he's too simple unless she put him up to it i thought i should never get round with the plate said george mr griffith being a carpenter which is respectable and well to do which is honourable had been made churchwarden and part of his duty was to take round the offertory plate this duty george performed in his father's occasional absences as when a coffin was very urgently required i wasn't going to let them get anything out of me said mrs griffith divinely all through the service a number of eyes had been fixed on them eager to catch some sign of emotion full of horrible curiosity to know what the griffiths felt and thought but mrs griffith had been inscrutable next day the griffiths lay in wait for the postman george sat by the parlour window peeping through the muslin curtains fanning's just coming up the street he said at last until the post had come old griffith could not work in the courtyard at the back was heard the sound of hammering there was a rat tat at the door the sound of a letter falling on the mat and fanning the postman passed on george leans back quickly so that he might not see him mr griffith fetched the letter opened it with trembling hands he gave a little gasp of relief she's got the situation in london is that all she says asked mrs griffith give me the letter and she almost tore it from her husband's hand she read it through and uttered a little ejaculation of contempt almost of triumph you don't mean to say you believe that she cried let's look mother said george he read the letter and he too gave a snort of contempt she says she's got a situation repeated mrs griffith with a sneer at her husband and we are not to be angry or anxious and she's quite happy and we can write to charing cross post office i know what sort of a situation she's got mr griffith looked from his wife to his son don't you think it's true he asked helplessly at the first moment he had put the fullest faith in daisy's letter he had been so anxious to believe it but the scorn of the others there's miss reed coming down the street said george she's looking this way and she's crossing over i believe she's coming in what does she want asked mrs griffith angrily there was another knock at the door and through the curtains they saw miss reed's eyes looking towards them trying to pierce the muslin mrs griffith motioned the two men out of the room and hurriedly put antimacassars on the chairs the knock was repeated and mrs griffith catching hold of a duster went to the door oh miss reed who'd have thought of seeing you she cried with surprise i hope i'm not disturbing answered miss reed with an acid smile oh dear no said mrs griffith i was just doing the dusting in the parlour come in won't you the place is all upside down but you won't mind that will you miss reed sat on the edge of a chair i thought i'd just pop in to ask about dear daisy i met fanning as i was coming along and he told me you'd had a letter oh daisy mrs griffith had understood at once why miss reed came but she was rather at a loss for an answer yes we have had a letter from her she's up in london yes i knew that said miss reed george browning saw them get into the london train you know mrs griffith saw it was no good fencing but an idea occurred to her yes of course her father and i are very distressed about her eloping like that i can quite understand that said miss reed but it was on account of his family he didn't want any one to know about it till he was married oh said miss reed raising her eyebrows very high yes said mrs griffith that's what she said in her letter they were married on saturday at the registry office but mrs griffith 
I'm afraid she's been deceiving you. It's Captain Hogan, and he's a married man. She could have laughed outright at the look of dismay on Mrs. Griffith's face. The blow was sudden, and notwithstanding all her power of self-control, Mrs. Griffith could not help herself. But at once she recovered. An angry flush appeared on her cheekbones. You don't mean it, she cried. I'm afraid it's quite true, said Miss Reed humbly. In fact, I know it is. Then she's a lying, deceitful hussy, and she's made a fool of all of us. I give you my word of honour that she told us she was married. I'll fetch you the letter. Mrs. Griffith rose from her chair, but Miss Reed put out a hand to stop her. Oh, don't trouble, Mrs. Griffith. Of course I believe you, she said, and Mrs. Griffith immediately sat down again. But she burst into a storm of abuse of Daisy, for her deceitfulness and wickedness. She vowed she should never forgive her. She assured Miss Reed again and again that she had known nothing about it. Finally, she burst into a perfect torrent of tears. Miss Reed was mildly sympathetic, but now she was anxious to get away to impart her news to the rest of Blackstable. Mrs. Griffith sobbed her visitor out of the front door, but when she had closed it, dried her tears. She went into the parlour and flung open the door that led to the back room. Griffith was sitting with his face hidden in his hands, and every now and then a sob shook his great frame. George was very pale, biting his nails. You heard what she said, cried Mrs. Griffith. He's married. She looked at her husband contemptuously. It's all very well for you to carry on like that now. It was you who did it. It was all your fault. If she'd been brought up as I wanted her to be, this wouldn't ever have happened. Again there was a knock, and George, going out, ushered in Mrs. Gray, the vicar's wife. She rushed in when she heard the sound of voices. Oh, Mrs. Griffith, it's dreadful, simply dreadful. Miss Reed has just told me all about it. What is to be done, and what will the dissenters make of it? Oh, dear, it's simply dreadful. You've just come in time, Mrs. Gray, said Mrs. Griffith angrily. It's not my fault, I can tell you that. It's her father who's brought it about. He would have her go into Tunkerbury to be educated, and he would have her take singing lessons and dancing lessons. The church school was good enough for George. It's been Daisy this and Daisy that all through. Me and George have been always put by for Daisy. I didn't want her brought up above her station. I can assure you, it's him who would have her brought up as a lady and see what's come of it. And he let her spend any money she liked on her dress. It wasn't me that let her go into Tunkerbury every day in the week if she wanted to. I knew she was up to no good. There you see, what you've brought her to is you who's disgraced us all. She heased out the words with intense malignity, nearly screaming in the bitterness she felt towards the beautiful daughter of better education than herself, almost of different station. It was all but a triumph for her that this had happened. It brought her daughter down. She turned the tables. And now, from the superiority of her virtue, she looked down upon her with utter contempt. On the following Sunday, the people of Blastable enjoyed an emotion, as Miss Reed said. It was worth going to church this morning, even for a dissenter. The vicar was preaching, and the congregation paid a very languid attention. But suddenly a curious little sound went through the church, one of those scarcely perceptible noises which no comparison can explain. It was a quick attraction of all eyes and the rousing of somnolent intelligences, a slight, quick drawing in of the breath. The listeners had heeded very indifferently Mr. Gray's admonitions to brotherly love and charity as matters which did not concern them other than abstractedly. But quite suddenly they had realised that he was bringing his discourse round to the subject of Daisy Griffith, and they pricked up both ears, they saw it coming directly along the highways of vanity and luxuriousness, and every one became intensely wide awake. And we have in all our minds, he said at last, the terrible fall which has almost broken the hearts of sorrowing parents and brought bitter grief, bitter grief and shame to all of us. 
He went on hinting at the scandal in the manner of the personal columns in newspapers, and drawing a number of obvious morals. The Griffiths family were sitting in their pew well in view of the congregation, and losing even the shadow of decency, the people turned round and stared at them, ghoul-like. Robert Griffith sat in the corner with his hat bent down, huddled up, his rough face speaking in all its lines the terrible humiliation. His hair was all dishevelled. He was not more than fifty, and he looked an old man. But Mrs. Griffith sat next to him, very erect, not leaning against the back, with her head well up, her mouth firmly closed, and she looked straight in front of her, her little eyes sparkling as if she had not an idea that a hundred people were staring at her. In the other corner was George, very white, looking up at the roof in simulation of indifference. Suddenly a sob came from the Griffiths' pill, and people saw that the father had broken down. He seemed to forget where he was, and he cried as if indeed his heart were broken. The great tears ran down his cheeks in the sight of all, the painful tears of men. He had not even the courage to hide his face in his hands. Still, Mrs. Griffith made no motion. She never gave a sigh that she hurt her husband's agony. But two little red spots appeared angrily on her cheekbones, and perhaps she compressed her lips a little more tightly. Six months passed. One evening, when Mr. Griffith was standing at the door after work, smoking his pipe, the postman handed him a letter. He changed colour, and his hand shook when he recognised the handwriting. He turned quickly into the house. A letter from Daisy, he said. They had not replied to her first letter, and since then had heard nothing. Give it me, said his wife. He drew it quickly towards him, with an instinctive gesture of retention. It's addressed to me. Well, then, you'd better open it. He looked up at his wife. He wanted to take the letter away and read it alone, but her eyes were upon him, compelling him there and then to open it. She wants to come back, he said in a broken voice. Mrs. Griffith snatched the letter from him. That means he's left her, she said. The letter was all incoherent, nearly incomprehensible, covered with blots every other word scratched out. One could see that the girl was quite distraught, and Mrs. Griffith's keen eyes saw the trace of tears on the paper. It was a long, bitter cry of repentance. She begged them to take her back, repeating again and again the cry of penitence, piteously beseeching them to forgive her. I'll go and write to her, said Mr. Griffith. Write what? Why? that it's all right and she isn't to worry and we want her back and that i go up and fetch her mrs griffith placed herself between him and the door what do you mean she cried she's not coming back into my house mr griffith started back you don't want to leave her where she is she says she'll kill herself yes i believe that she replied scornfully, and then, gathering up her anger, Do you mean to say you expect me to have her in the house after what she's done? I tell you I won't. She's never coming in this house again as long as I live. I'm an honest woman, and she isn't. She's a... Mrs. Griffith called her daughter the foulest name that can be applied to her sex. Mr. Griffith stood indecisively before his wife. But think what state she's in, mother. She was crying when she wrote the letter. Let her cry. She'll have to cry a lot more before she's done. And it serves her right. And it serves you right. She'll have to go through a good deal more than that before God forgives her, I can tell you. Perhaps she's starving. Let her starve, for all I care. She's dead to us. I've told everyone in Blackstable that I haven't got a daughter now, and if she came on her bended knees before me, I'd spit on her. George had come in and listened to the conversation. Think what people would say, father, he said now. As it is, it's jolly awkward, I can tell you. No one would speak to us if she was back again. It's not as if people didn't know. Everyone in Blackstable knows that what she's been up to. And what about George? put in mrs griffith do you think the pollets would stand it 
George was engaged to Edith Pollitt. She'd been quite capable of breaking it off if Daisy came back, said George. She said as much. Quite right, too, cried his mother. And I'm not going to be like Mrs. J with Lotte. Everyone knows about Lotte's goings on, and you can see how people treat them, her and her mother. When Mrs. Gray passes them in the street, she always goes on the other side. No, I've always held my head high, and I'm always going to. I've never done anything to be ashamed of as far as I know, and I'm not going to begin now. Everyone knows it was no fault of mine what Daisy did, and all through I've behaved so that no one should think the worse of me. Mr. Griffith sank helplessly into a chair. The old habits of submission asserted itself and his weakness gave way as usual before his wife's strong will he had not the courage to oppose her what shall i answer then he asked answer nothing i must write something she'll be waiting for the letter and waiting and waiting let her wait a few days later another letter came from daisy asking pitifully why they didn't write begging them again to forgive her and take her back the letter was addressed to mr griffith the girl knew that it was only from him she might expect mercy, but he was out when it arrived. Mrs. Griffith opened it and passed it on to her son. They looked at one another guiltily. The same thought had occurred to both, and each knew it was in the other's mind. I don't think we'd better let father see it, Mrs. Griffith said, a little uncertainly. It'll do no good and it'll only distress him. And it's no good making a fuss, because we can't have her back. She'll never enter this door as long as I am in the world. I think I'll lock it up. I'd burn it if I was you, mother. It's safer. Then every day Mrs. Griffith made a point of going to the door herself with the letters. Two more came from Daisy. I know it's not you. It's mother and George. They've always hated me. Oh, don't be so cruel, father. You don't know what I've gone through. I've cried and cried till I thought I should die. For God's sake, write to me. They might let you write just once. I'm alone all day, day after day, and I think I shall go mad. You might take me back. I'm sure I've suffered enough, and you wouldn't know me now. I'm so changed. Tell mother that if she'll only forgive me, I'll be quite different. I'll do the housework and anything she tells me. I'll be a servant to you, and you can send a girl away, if you know how I repent. Do forgive me and have me back. Oh, I know that no one would speak to me, but I don't care about that if I can only be with you. She doesn't think about us, said George. What we should do if she was back? No one would speak to us either. But the next letter said that she couldn't bear the terrible silence. If her father didn't write, she'd come down to Blackstable. Mrs. Griffith was furious. I shut the door in her face. I wonder how she can dare to come. It's jolly awkward, said George, supposing Father found out we'd kept back the letters. It was for his own good, said Mrs. Griffith angrily. I'm not ashamed of what I've done, and I'll tell him so to his face if he says anything to me. Well, it is awkward. You know what Father is, if he saw her. Mrs. Griffith paused a moment. You must go up and see her, George. Me? he cried in astonishment, a little in terror. You must go as if you came from your father, to say we won't have anything more to do with her and she's not to write. Next day George Griffith, on getting out of the station of Victoria, jumped on a Fulham bus, taking his seat with the self assertiveness of the countryman who intends to show the Londoners that he's as good as they are. He was in some trepidation and his best clothes. He did not know what to say to Daisy and his hand sweated uncomfortably. When he knocked at the door, he wished she might be out, but that would only be postponing the ordeal. Does Mrs. Hogan live here? Yes. Who shall I say? Say a gentleman wants to see her. He followed quickly on the landlady's heels and passed through the door. The woman opened while she was giving the message. Daisy sprang to her feet with a cry. George! She was very pale her blue eyes dim and lifeless, with the lids heavy and red. She was in a dressing gown, her beautiful hair dishevelled, wound loosely into a knot at the back of her head. 
she had not half the beauty of her old self george to affirm the superiority of virtue over vice kept his hat on she looked at him with frightened eyes then her lips quivered and turning away her head she fell on a chair and burst into tears george looked at her sternly his indignation was greater than ever now that he saw her his old jealousy made him exult at the change in her she's got nothing much to boast about now he said to himself noting how ill she looked oh george she began sobbing but he interrupted her i've come from father he said and we don't want to have anything more to do with you and you're not to write oh she looked at him now with her eyes suddenly quite dry they seemed to burn her in their sockets did he send you here to tell me that yes and you're not to come down she put her hand to her forehead looking vacantly before her but what am i to do i haven't got any money i've pawned everything george looked at her silently but he was horribly curious where did he leave you he said she made no answer she looked before her as if she were going out of her mind has he left you any money asked george then she started up her cheeks flaming red i wouldn't touch a halfpenny of his i'd rather starve she screamed george shrugged his shoulders well you understand he said oh how can you it's all you and mother you've always hated me but i'll pay you out by god i'll pay you out i know what you are all of you you and mother and all the blackstable people you are a set of damned hypocrites look here daisy i'm not going to stand here and hear you talk like that of me and mother he replied with dignity and as for the blessable people you're not fit to, to associate with them and i can see where you learnt your language daisy burst into hysterical laughter george became more angry virtuously indignant oh you can laugh as much as you like i know your repentance is a lot of damned humbug you've always been a conceited little beast and you've been stuck up and cocky because you thought yourself nice-looking and because you were educated in tankerbury and no one was good enough for you in blackstable and i'm jolly glad that all this has happened to you it serves you jolly well right and if you dare to show yourself in blackstable we'll send for the police daisy stepped up to him i'm a damned bad lot she said but i swear i'm not half as bad as you are you know what you're driving me to you don't think i care what you do he answered as he flung himself out of the door he slammed it behind him he also slammed the front door to show that he was a man of high principles and even george washington when he said i cannot tell a lie i did it with my little hatchet did not feel so righteous as george griffith at that moment daisy went to the window to see him go and then throwing up her arms she fell on her knees weeping weeping and she cried my god have pity on me end of section eight section nine of orientations this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lily brenda orientations by w somerset mom section nine daisy part two i wouldn't go through it again for a hundred pounds said george when he recounted his experience to his mother and she wasn't a bit humble as you'd expect oh that's daisy all over whatever happens to her she'll be as bold as brass and she didn't choose her language he said with mingled grief and horror they heard nothing more of daisy for over a year when george went up to london for the choir treat he did not come back till three o'clock in the morning but he went at once to his mother's room he woke her very carefully so as not to disturb his father she started up about to speak but he prevented her with his hand come outside i've got something to tell you mrs griffith was about to tell him rather crossly to wait till the morrow but he interrupted her i've seen daisy she quickly got out of bed and they went together into the parlour i couldn't keep it till the morning he said what do you think she's doing now 
Well, after we came out of the empire, I went down Piccadilly, and, well, I saw Daisy standing there. It did give me a turn, I can tell you. I thought some of the chaps would see her. I simply went cold all over, but they were on ahead and hadn't noticed her. Thank God for that, said Mrs. Griffith, piously. Well, what do you think I did? I went straight up to her and looked her full in the face. But do you think she moved a muscle? She simply looked at me as if she'd never set eyes on me before. Well, I was taken aback, I can tell you. I thought she'd faint. Not a bit of it. No, I know Daisy, said Mrs. Griffith. You think she's decent that, because she looks at you with those blue eyes of hers, as if she couldn't say bow to a goose, but she's got the very devil inside her. Well, I shall tell her father that, just so as to let him see what she has come to. The existence of the Griffiths' household went on calmly. Husband and wife and son led their life in the dull little fishing town. The seasons passed insensibly into one another. One year slid gradually into the next. And the five years that went by seemed like one long, long day. Mrs. Griffith did not alter an atom. She performed her housework, went to church regularly, and behaved like a Christian woman in that state of life in which a merciful providence had been pleased to put her. George got married, and on Sunday afternoons could be seen wheeling an infant in a perambulator along the street. He was a good husband and an excellent father. He never drank too much, he worked well, he was careful of his earnings, and he also went to church regularly. His ambition was to become churchwarden after his father, and even in Mr. Griffith, there was not so very much change. He was more bowed, his hair and beard were greyer, his face was set in an expression of passive misery, and he was extremely silent. But as Mrs. Griffith said, of course, he's getting old, one can't expect to remain young forever. She was a woman who frequently said profound things, and I've known all along he wasn't the sort of man to make old bones. He's never had the go in him that I have. Why? I'd make two of him. The Griffiths were not so well to do as before, as Blackstable became a more important health resort. A regular undertaker opened a shop there, and his window, with two little model coffins and an arrangement of black prints of whales' feathers surrounded by a white wreath, took the fancy of the natives so that Mr. Griffith almost completely lost the most remunerative part of his business. Other carpenters sprang into existence and took away much of the trade. I've no patience with him, said Mrs. Griffith, of her husband. She lets these newcomers come along and just take the bread out of his hands. Oh, if I was a man, I'd make things different, I can tell you. He doesn't seem to care. At last, one day George came to his mother in a state of tremendous excitement. I say, mother, you know the pantomime they've got at Tankerbury this week? Yes. Well, the principal boy's Daisy. Mrs. Griffith sank into a chair, gasping. Harry Fern's been, and he recognised her at once. It's all over the town. Mrs. Griffith, for the first time in her life, was completely at a loss for words. Tomorrow's the last night added her son after a little while and all the blastable people are going to think that this should happen to me said mrs griffith distractedly what have i done to deserve it why couldn't it happen to mrs garman or mrs j if the lord had seen fit to bring it upon them well i shouldn't have wondered edith wants us to go said george edith was his wife you don't mean to say you're going, with all the Blackstable people there? Well, Edith says we ought to go, just to show them we don't care. Well, I shall come too, cried Mrs. Griffith. Next evening, half Blackstable took the special train to Tankerbury, which had been put on for the pantomime, and there was such a crowd at the doors that the impresario half thought of extending his stay, the Reverend Charles Gray and Mrs. Gray were there, also James, their nephew. Mr. Gray had some scrubbles about going to a theatre, but his wife said the pantomime was quite different. Besides, curiosity may gently enter even a clerical bosom. Miss Reed was there in black satin, with her friend Mrs. Howlett. 
Mrs. Griffith sat in the middle of the stalls, flanked by her dutiful son and her daughter-in-law, and George searched for female beauty with his opera glass, which is quite the proper thing to do on such occasions. The curtain went up, and the villagers of Dick Whittington's native place sang a chorus. Now she's coming, whispered George. All those flexible hearts stood still, and Daisy, as Dick Whittington, bounded on the stage in flesh-coloured tights with particularly scanty trunks, and her bodice rather low. The vicar's nephew sniggered, and Mrs. Gray gave him a reproachful glance. All the other Blackstable people looked pained. Miss Reed blushed. But as Daisy waved her hand and gave a kick, the audience broke out into prolonged applause. Tankerbury people have no moral sense, although Tankerbury is a cathedral city. Daisy began to sing. I'm a jolly sort of boy, tall, low, and I don't care a damn who knows it. I'm fond of every joy, tall, low, as you may very well suppose it. Tall, low, low, tall, low, low. Then the audience, the audience of a cathedral city, as Mr. Gray said, took up the refrain. Tall, low, low, tall, low, low. However, the piece went on to the bitter end, and Dick Whittington appeared in many different costumes and sang many songs and kicked many kicks till he was finally made Lord Major in tights. Ah, it was an evening of bitter humiliation for Blackstable people. Some of them, as Miss Reed said, behaved scandalously. They really appeared to enjoy it, and even George laughed at some of the jokes the cat made, so his wife and his mother sternly reproved him. I'm ashamed of you, George, laughing at such a time, they said. Afterwards, the Grays and Miss Reed got into the same railway carriage with the Griffiths. Well, Mrs. Griffith, said the vicar's wife, what do you think of your daughter now? Mrs. Gray replied to Mrs. Griffith solemnly, I haven't got a daughter. That's a very proper spirit in which to look at it answered the lady. She was simply covered with diamonds. They must be worth a fortune, said Miss Reed. Oh, I dare say they're not real, said Mrs. Gray. At that distance and with the limelight, you know, it's very difficult to tell. I'm sorry to say, said Mrs. Griffith, with some asperity, feeling the doubt almost an affront to her. I'm sorry to say that I know they're real. The ladies coughed discreetly, scenting a little scandalous mystery which they must get out of Mrs. Griffith at another opportunity. My nephew James says she earns at least thirty or forty pounds a week. Miss Reed sighed at the thought of such depravity. It's very sad, she remarked, to think of such things happening to a fellow creature. But what I can't understand, said Mrs. Gray next morning at the breakfast table, is how she got into such a position. We all know that at one time she was to be seen in, well, in a very questionable place, at an hour which left no doubt about her, her means of livelihood. I must say I thought she was quite lost. Oh, well, I can tell you that easily enough, replied her nephew. She's being kept by Sir Somebody Something, and he's running the show for her. James, I wish you would be more careful about your language. It's not necessary to call a spade a spade, and you can surely find a less objectionable expression to explain the relationship between the persons. Don't you remember his name? No, I heard it, but I've really forgotten. I see in this week's Tankerbury Times that there's a Sir Herbert Astley Farrowham staying at the George just now. That's it, Sir Herbert Astley Farrowham. How sad. I look him out in back. She took down the reference book, which was kept beside the clergy list. Dear me, he's only twenty-nine, and he's got a house in Cavendish Square and a house in the country. He must be very well to do, and he belongs to the junior Carlton and two other clubs, and he's got a sister's marriage to Lord Edward Lick. Mrs. Gray closed the book and held it with a finger to mark the place like a Bible. It's very sad to think of the dissipation of so many members of the aristocracy. It sets such a bad example to the lower classes. They showed old Griffith a portrait of Daisy in her theatrical costume. Has she come to that? he said. He looked at it a moment, then savagely tore it in pieces and flung it in the fire. 
Oh, my God, he groaned. He could not get out of his head the picture, the shamelessness of the costume, the smile, the evident prosperity and content. He felt now that he had lost his daughter indeed. All these years he had kept his heart open to her, and his heart had bled when he thought of her starving, ragged, perhaps dead. He had thought of her begging her bread and working her beautiful hands to the bone in some factory. He had always hoped that some day she could return to him, purified by the fire of suffering. But she was prosperous and happy and rich. She was applauded, worshipped. The papers were full of her praise. Old Griffith was filled with a feeling of horror, of immense repulsion. She was flourishing in her scene, and he loathed her. He had been so ready to forgive her when he thought her despairing and unhappy. But now he was implacable. Three months later, Mrs. Griffith came to her husband, trembling with excitement, and handed him a cutting from a paper. We hear that Miss Daisy Griffith, who earned golden opinions in the provinces last winter with her Dick Whittington, is about to be married to Sir Herbert Astley Farenham, her friends, and their name is Legion, will join with us in the heartiest congratulation. He returned the paper without answering. Well? asked his wife. It is nothing to me. I don't know either of the parties mentioned. At that moment there was a knock at the door, and Mrs. Gray and Miss Reed entered, having met on the doorstep. Mrs. Griffith at once regained her self-possession. Have you heard the news, Mrs. Griffith? said Miss Reed. Do you mean about the marriage of Sir Herbert Astley Farham? She mouthed the long name. Yes, replied the two ladies together. It is nothing to me. I have no daughter, Mrs. Gray. I'm sorry to hear you say that, Mrs. Griffith, said Mrs. Gray very stiffly. I think you show a most unforgiving spirit. Yes, said Miss Reed. I can't help thinking that if you'd treat a poor Daisy in a, well, in a more Christian way, you might have saved her from a great deal. Yes, added Mrs. Gray. I must say that all through I don't think you've shown a nice spirit at all. I remember poor dear Daisy quite well, and she had a very sweet character, and I'm sure that if she'd been treated a little more gently, nothing of all this would have happened. Mrs. Gray and Miss Reed looked at Mrs. Griffith sternly and reproachfully. They felt themselves like God Almighty judging a miserable sinner. Mrs. Griffith was extremely angry. She felt that she was being blamed most unjustly, and, moreover, she was not used to being blamed. I'm sure you're very kind, Mrs. Gray, Miss Reed, but I must take the liberty of saying that I know best what my daughter was. Mrs. Griffith, all I say is this, you are not a good mother. Excuse me, madam, said Mrs. Griffith, having grown red with anger, but Mrs. Gray interrupted. I am truly sorry to have to say it to one of my parishioners, but you are not a good Christian, and we all know that your husband's business isn't going at all well and I think it's a judgment of providence. Very well, ma'am, said Mrs. Griffith, getting up. You are at liberty to think what you please, but I shall not come to church again. Mr. Friend, the Baptist minister, has asked me to go to his chapel, and I'm sure he won't treat me like that. I'm sure we don't want you to come to church in that spirit, Mrs. Griffith. That's not the spirit with which you can please God, Mrs. Griffith. I can quite imagine now why dear Daisy ran away. You are no Christian. I'm sure I don't care what you think, Mrs. Gray, but I'm as good as you are. Will you open the door for me, Mrs. Griffith? said Mrs. Gray, with outraged dignity. Oh, you can open it yourself, Mrs. Gray, replied Mrs. Griffith. Mrs. Griffith went to see her daughter-in-law. I've never been spoken to in that way before, she said. Fancy me not being a Christian. I'm a better Christian than Mrs. Gray any day. I like Mrs. Gray, with the airs she gives herself, as if she'd got anything to boast about. No, Edith, I've said it, and I'm not the woman to go back on what I've said. I'll not go to church again. From this day I go to chapel. But George came to see his mother a few days later. Look here, mother. Edith said you'd better forgive Daisy now. George, cried his mother, I've only done my duty all through, and if you think it's my duty to forgive my daughter now, she's going to enter the bonds of holy matrimony, I will do so. No one can say that I'm not a Christian. 
and i haven't said the lord's prayer night and morning ever since i remember for nothing mrs griffith sat down to write looking up to her son for inspiration dearest daisy he said no george she replied i'm not going to cringe to my daughter although she is going to be a lady i shall simply say daisy the letter was very dignified gently reproachful for daisy had undoubtedly committed certain peccadilloes although she was going to be a baronet's wife but still it was completely forgiven and mrs griffith sighed herself your loving and forgiving mother whose heart she nearly broke but the letter was not answered and a couple of weeks later the same sunday paper contained an announcement of the date of the marriage and the name of the church mrs griffith wrote a second time my darling daughter i am much surprised at receiving no answer to my long letter always forgiven i should so much like to see you again before i die and to have you married from your father's house always forgiven your loving mother mary ann griffith this time the letter was returned unopened george cried mrs griffith she's got her back up and the wedding's to-morrow he replied it's most awkward george i've told all the blackstable people that i've forgiven her and that sir herbert has written to say he wants to make my acquaintance and i've got a new dress on purpose to go to the wedding oh she's a cruel and exasperating thing george i never liked her you were always my favourite well i do think she's not acting as she should replied george and i'm sure i don't know what's to be done but mrs griffith was a woman who made up her mind quickly i shall go up to town and see her myself george and you must come too i'll come up with you mother but you'd better go to her alone because i expect she's not forgotten the last time i saw her they caught a train immediately and having arrived at daisy's house mrs griffith went up the steps while george waited in a neighbouring public house the door was opened by a smart maid much smarter than the vicarage maid at Glastable. as mrs griffith remarked with satisfaction on finding that daisy was at home she sent up a message to ask if a lady could see her the maid returned would you give your name madam miss griffith cannot see you without mrs griffith had foreseen the eventuality and unwilling to give her a card had written another little letter using edith as amanuensis so that daisy should at least open it she sent it up in a few minutes the maid came down again there's no answer and she opened the door for mrs griffith to go out that lady turned very red her first impulse was to make a scene and call the housemaid to witness how daisy treated her own mother but immediately she thought how undignified she would appear in the maid's eyes so she went out like a lamb she told george all about it as they sat in the private bar of the public house drinking a little scotch whisky all i can say she remarked is that i hope she'll never live to repent it fancy treating her own mother like that but i shall go to the wedding i don't care i will see my own daughter married that had been her great ambition and she would have crawled before daisy to be asked to the ceremony but george dissuaded her from going uninvited there were sure to be one or two blackstable people present and they would see that she was there as a stranger the humiliation would be too great i think she's an ungrateful girl said mrs griffith as she gave way and allowed george to take her back to blackstable but the prestige of the griffiths diminished every one in blackstable came to the conclusion that the new lady asley farrowham had been very badly treated by her relatives and many young ladies said they would have done just the same in her place also mrs gray induced her husband to ask griffith to resign his church wardenship you know mr griffith said the vicar deprecatingly now that your wife goes to chapel i don't think we can have you as church warden any longer and besides i don't think you've behaved to your daughter in a christian way it was in the carpenter's shop the business had dwindled till griffith only kept one man and a boy he put aside a saw he was using what i've done to my daughter i'm willing to take the responsibility for i ask no one's advice and want no one's opinion and if you think i'm not fit to be churchwarden you can find someone else better why don't you make it up with your daughter griffith mind your own business the carpenter had brooded and brooded over his sorrow 
till now his daughter's name roused him to fury he had even asserted a little authority over his wife and she dared not mention her daughter before him daisy's marriage had seemed like the consummation of her shame it was vice riding triumphant in a golden chariot but the name of lady usley farrowham was hardly ever out of her mother's lips and she spent a good deal more money in her dress to keep up her dignity why there's another new dress you've got on said the neighbour yes said mrs griffith complacently you see we're in quite a different position now i have to think of my daughter lady usley farrowham i don't want her to be ashamed of her mother i had such a nice long letter from her the other day she's so happy with sir herbert and sir herbert's so good to her oh i didn't know you were oh yes of course she was a little well a little wild when she was a girl but i've forgiven that it's her father won't forgive her he always was a hard man and he never loved her as i did she wants to come and stay with me but he won't let her isn't it cruel of him i should like to have lady usley farrenham down here but at last the crash came to pay for the new things which mrs griffith found needful to preserve her dignity she had drawn on her husband's savings in the bank and he had been drawing on them himself for the last four years without his wife's knowledge for as his business declined he had been afraid to give her less money than usual and every week had made up the sum by taking something out of the bank george only earned a pound a week he had been made clerk to a co-merchant by his mother who thought that more genteel than carpentry and after his marriage he had constantly borrowed from his parents at last mrs griffith learned to her dismay that their savings had come to an end completely she had a talk with her husband and found out that he was earning almost nothing he talked of sending his only remaining workmen away and moving into a smaller place if he kept his one or two old customers they might just manage to make both ends meet mrs griffith was burning with anger she looked at her husband sitting in front of her with his helpless look you fool she said she thought of herself coming down in the world living in a poky little house away from the high street unable to buy new dresses unnoticed by the chief people at blackstable she who had always held up her hat with the best of them george and edith came in and she told them hurling contemptuous sarcasms at her husband he sat looking at them with his pained unhappy eyes while they stared back at him as if he were some despicable noxious beast but why didn't you say how things were going before father george asked him he shrugged his shoulders i didn't like to he said hoarsely those cold angry eyes crushed him he felt the stupid useless fool he saw they thought him i don't know what's to be done said george his wife looked at old griffith with her hard grey eyes the sharpness of her features the firm clear complexion with all softness blown out of it by the east winds expressed the coldest resolution father must get daisy to help she's got lots of money she may do it for him old griffith broke suddenly out of his apathy i'd sooner go to the workhouse i'll never touch a penny of hers now then father said mrs griffith quickly understanding you drop that you have to george at the same time got pen and paper and put them before the old man they stood round him angrily he stared at the paper a look of horror came over his face go on don't be a fool said his wife she dipped the pen in the ink and handed it to him edith's still grey eyes were fixed on him coldly compelling dear daisy she began father always used to call her daisy darling said george he'd better put that so as to bring back old times they talked of him strangely as if he were absent and had not ears to hear very well replied edith and she began again the old man wrote bewilderedly as if he were asleep daisy darling forgive me i have been hard and cruel towards you on my knees i beg your forgiveness the business has gone wrong and i'm ruined if you don't help me we shall have brokers in and have to go to the workhouse for god's sake have mercy on me you can't let me starve i know i have sinned towards you you are broken-hearted father she read through the letter i think they'll do now the envelope 
and she dictated the address. When it was finished, Griffith looked at them with loathing, absolute loathing, but they paid no more attention to him. They arranged to send a telegram first, in case she should not open the letter. Letter coming, for God's sake open, in great distress, father. George went out immediately to send a wire and post the letter. The letter was sent on a Tuesday, and on Thursday morning a telegram came from Daisy to say she was coming down. Mrs. Griffith was highly agitated. I'll go and put on my silk dress, she said. No, mother, that is a silly thing. Be as shabby as you can. How father be? asked George. You'd better speak to him, Edith. He was called, the stranger in his own house. Look here, father, this is coming this morning. Now you'll be seaful, won't you? I'm afraid he'll go and spoil everything, said Mrs. Griffith anxiously. At that moment there was a knock at the door. It's her. Griffith was pushed into the back room. Mrs. Griffith hurriedly put on a ragged apron and went to the door. Daisy, she cried, opening her arms. She embraced her daughter and pressed her to her voluminous bosom. Oh, Daisy! Daisy accepted passively the tokens of affection with a little sad smile. She tried not to be unsympathetic. Mrs. Griffith led her daughter into the sitting room where George and Edith were sitting. George was very white. You don't mean to say you walked here? said Mrs. Griffith, as she shut the front door. Fancy that, when you could have all the carriages in Blackstable to drive you about. Welcome to your home again, said George, with somewhat the air of a dissenting minister. Oh, George, she said, with the same sad, half-ironical smile, allowing herself to be kissed. Don't you remember me? said Edith, coming forward. I'm George's wife. I used to be Edith Pollitt. Oh, yes. Daisy put out her hand. They all three looked at her, and the women noticed the elegance of her simple dress. She was no longer the merry girl they had known, but a tall, dignified woman, and her great blue eyes were very grave. They were rather afraid of her, but Mrs. Griffith made an effort to be cordial and at the same time familiar. Fancy you being a real lady, she said. Daisy smiled again. Where's father? she asked. In the next room. They moved towards the door and entered. Old oh, Griffith rose as he saw his daughter, but he did not come towards her. She looked at him a moment, then turned to the others. Please leave me alone with father for a few minutes. They did not want to, knowing that their presence would restrain him, but Daisy looked at them so firmly that they were obliged to obey. She closed the door behind them. Father, she said, turning towards him. They made me write a letter, he said hoarsely. I thought so, she said. Won't you kiss me? He stepped backward, as if in repulsion. She looked at him with her beautiful eyes full of tears. I'm so sorry I've made you unhappy. But I've been unhappy too. Oh, you don't know what I've gone through. Won't you forgive me? I didn't write the letter. He repeated hoarsely. They stood over me and made me. Her lips trembled but with an effort she commanded herself. They looked at one another steadily. It seemed for a very long time. In his eyes was the look of a hunted beast. At last she turned away without saying anything more, and left him. In the next room the three were anxiously waiting. She contemplated them a moment, and then, sitting down, asked about the affairs. They explained how things were. I talked to my husband about it, she said. He's proposed to make you an allowance so that you can retire from business. Oh, that's Sir Herbert all over, said Mrs. Griffith, greasily. She knew nothing about him but his name. How much do you think you could leave off? asked Daisy. Mrs. Griffith looked at George and then at Edith. What should they ask? Edith and George exchanged a glance. They were in agonies lest Mrs. Griffith should demand too little. Well, said the lady at last, with a little cough of uncertainty. In our best years we used to make four pounds a week out of the business, didn't we, George? Quite that, answered he and his wife, in a breath. Then shall I tell my husband that if he allows you five pounds a week you will be able to live comfortably? Oh, that's very handsome, said Mrs. Griffith. Very well, said Daisy, getting up. You're not going, cried her mother. Yes. Well, that is hard, 
after not seeing you all these years but you know best of course there's no train up to london for two hours yet said george no i want to take a walk through blackstable oh you'd better drive in your position i prefer to walk shall george come with you i prefer to walk alone then mrs griffith again enveloped her daughter in her arms and told her she had always loved her and that she was her only daughter after which daisy allowed herself to be embraced by her brother and his wife finally they shut the door on her and watched her from the window walk slowly down the high street if you'd asked it i believe she'd have gone up to six quid a week said george daisy walked down the high street slowly looking at the houses she remembered and her lips quivered a little at every step smells blew across to her full of memories the smell of a tannery the blood smell of a butcher's shop the sea odour from a shop of fishermen's clothes at last she came on to the beach and in the darkening november day she looked at the booth she knew so well the boats drawn up for the winter whose names she knew whose owners she had known from her childhood she noticed the new villas built in her absence and she looked at the grey sea a sob burst from her but she was very strong and at once she recovered herself she turned back and slowly walked up the high street again to the station the lamps were lighted now and the street looked as it had looked in her memory through the years between the green dragon and the duke of kent where the same groups of men farmers townsfolk fishermen talking in the glare of the rival inns and they stared at her curiously as she passed a tall figure closely veiled she looked at the well-remembered shops the stationery shop with its old-fashioned fly-blown knick-knacks the milliners with cheap gaudy hats the little tailors with his antiquated fashion plates at last she came to the station and sat in the waiting-room her heart full of infinite sadness the terrible sadness of the past and she could not shake it off in the train she could only just keep back the tears at victoria she took a cab and finally reached home the servant said her husband was in his study hello he said i didn't expect you tonight i couldn't stay it was awful then she went up to him and looked into his eyes you do love me herbert don't you she said her voice suddenly breaking i want your love so badly i love you with all my heart he said putting his arms round her but she could restrain herself no longer the strong arms seemed to take away the rest of her strength and she burst into tears i will try and be a good wife to you herbert she said as he kissed them away end of section nine